So the question for the debate is, is Muhammad a good role model to society? The wonderful speakers who we have with us today are David Wood and Sami Zatari. Thank you for being able to make it today and it is an honor to have you here at HFCC. Uh, David Wood is a former atheist who became a Christian after examining the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. He is currently the director of Act 17 Apologetics and has been in more than 30 moderate public debates. David is the host of ABN's live talk show, Jesus or Muhammad. You can reach him at his blog, www.answeringmuslims.com. Our next speaker is Sami Zatari, who is an international speaker with the Muslim Debate Initiative and has debated the issues of Christianity, secularism, and atheism with a variety of opponents. He has held debates in the U.S. and the, UA, in the U.K. Sami has a master's in the field of Middle East politics and also contributes articles to the Palestine Chronicle. He currently runs two websites, one Muslim, muslim-responses.com as well as ilovemuhammad.com. So the debate format will go as follows. Number one, 20 minutes each where the opening uh, statement will be given for each speaker. Number two, 12 minutes each uh, for the first rebuttal for, every, for each speaker. 10 minutes, the second rebuttal. Eight minutes for the third rebuttal. And three minutes for the conclusion for every speaker. We will then take the rest of the time for the question and answer session. Uh, so uh, the first speaker we'll be, we will be bringing to the podium is Sami Zatari, or to your desk. Um, thank you for coming, and there you go. All right, uh, is the sound all right? Is it good? All right, thank you very much, and I'd like to uh, thank David as well, because we set this up just last week on uh, short notice. So tonight's debate, uh, is the Prophet Muhammad a good role model for society? Now, before we answer that question, we actually have to look at modern society and what problems modern society faces, and then we can look to see if the Prophet Muhammad comes as a good solution and example for those problems. So basically I've listed a set of four main problems we see in the world today and obviously there's probably more but these are four of the main ones. In today's world and society we have a big problem with poverty. The world is filled with a very large poor population living below the poverty line and the situation is getting worse every day. I mean, this is one of the main problems we face as a society. I mean, here in America alone, there are many millions of people who are struggling to get basic health care because of financial issues, and many of them have gone bankrupt, and then you have a lot of homeless people at the same time. And this is a first world country, so imagine how much worse it is in third world countries, in Africa and certain Asian countries. So we have a big problem of poverty, poor people all around the world. Another problem we face in society, and this is the second problem, is that we have a lot of bad people in this world. And bad people can be split into several different categories. The first category of bad people can be summarized with people with bad manners, people with a bad attitude, and people with basically an uncaring attitude, you know, the selfish type of people. Then you have the people of the more serious kind, the worst type of people, such as the oppressors, people who do uh, very bad things. You know, they murder innocent people, they oppress innocent people, and so forth. Fourthly, another type of problem we face, we have people who are bigots and racists, and even though we've come a long way as a society, we still have a lot of racism and bigotry in this world today. So therefore, in light of these problems we face, um, how does the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, fare as a role model and solution to these specific main problems? Uh, let's start with the first one, with the poor people, helping the poor, the weak, those in poverty. Now in Islam, Islam, one of the main pillars of Islam is the zakat, which is a obligatory charity tax which Muslims pay every year from their wealth to the poor. 
Now, indeed, such a tax can go a very long way in helping poverty if everybody gives from their wealth to those who are in need. And this is a pillar of Islam. This is not something that um, you can just feel like doing. This is something Muslims must do. It's, it's, as I said, it's one of the pillars of Islam. And this is solely a tax for poor people. That's the main purpose of this tax. You can even call it a poor tax. Another great teaching of the Prophet Muhammad comes from the Hadiths. And I'm sure many Muslims know about this, but I'm sure non-Muslims can appreciate this teaching. And as the Prophet said, the believer is not one who eats his fill when the neighbor beside him is hungry. Now that right there is a very powerful, beautiful teaching, especially in today's society. I mean, you're not a true believer while you eat and people are starving right beside you. In other words, you must look after them. Not just eat yourself and be satisfied, but help other people as well. Let them have the food if they're poor, help them out. And the Prophet Muhammad would also used to encourage his companions to help the beggars. For instance, again in the hadiths in Sahih Bukhari, which is one of the books of the hadiths. Whenever a beggar used to come to the Prophet and his companions, the Prophet would tell his companions to help them as an example. So he would never turn them away. He would always tell his companions to help the poor, the beggars, and that they would be rewarded for that. In fact, most of the early Muslims were poor people. At the start of Islam, the majority of converts were poor people from the lower spectrum of society. And the irony is that the pagans used to use this as an insult towards the Muslims. They used to tell the Muslims, um, look at you. The majority of your people are from the poor and the weak. If Islam was true, then the rich would be with you. And the irony is that uh, pagan opponents of Christianity said the same thing to early Christians. So that's a similarity between both faiths. And then you have the orphans and the widows. Anyone who studies the hadiths will see that the Prophet Muhammad was insistent upon helping the orphans, uh, looking after them, and as well as the widows. I mean, the Prophet Muhammad likened the one who looked after the widow as taking part in jihad to look after the widow. So there is a great reward in that, as well as looking after the sick. So basically, that's a very good role model to help the poor, the weak, those in poverty, people who essentially need help. I don't think anyone can look at that and say, that's a bad role model for society. Now the second point, the third problem, or the second problem, which is, as I said, people in today's society who are basically bad behavior, bad attitude, and we see this every day. I mean, just yesterday, you can even find videos on YouTube. Just yesterday, I watched a video on YouTube of a bunch of teenagers abusing a lady on a bus to the point where she started crying. You know, she was a bit overweight and she was old and they were mocking her the whole time and she started crying and you can watch many of these type of videos on YouTube where you find people abusing and making fun of other people and sometimes it's not recorded you see it every day so what is the Prophet Muhammad's example when it comes to this type of behavior and as we know we as a people we have a problem with our some people have a problem with their tempers and their anger you know when they feel wronged they want to retaliate tribal mentality. So what did the Prophet have to say about that? As he said, do not be people without minds of your own, saying that if others treat you well, you will treat them well. And if they do wrong to you, you will do wrong to them. Instead, accustom yourselves to do good if people do good, and to not do bad if they do bad to you. Now that right there is a very good teaching. Don't do basically two wrongs don't make a right. So if someone is bad to you, as you said, don't be a person without a mind, with a tribalistic mentality, and say, now I'm going to be bad to him. And then another teaching of the Prophet, whoever suffers an injury done to him and forgives that person, God will raise his status and remove one of his sins. So again, all about controlling your temper. If someone is bad to you, you don't return it back to him, forgive him, be a person with your mind, because as you know, when you're angry, you sometimes lose your mind. Now, as I said, what about bad behavior and those type of bad attitudes? 
as the Prophet said, the Muslim does not slander, he does not curse, he does not speak obscenely, nor does he speak rudely. In fact, the Prophet even said, if you have nothing good to say, then remain silent. And the irony is that the lady who was being bullied in that video said the same thing to those kids, and I found that very interesting. The Prophet also taught the Muslims that God has revealed to the Muslims that they must be humble and that they must not be boastful or oppress other people. And as we know, in today's society, we have a lot of uh, show-offs with uh, big egos, and they like to put people down, and they like to boast about themselves. And then we also have people who like to be judgmental. In today's society, there's a lot of judgmental people pointing their fingers at others. And as the Prophet said, do not search for the fault of others, because if anyone searches for your faults, God will search for his. In other words, don't go looking for trouble with other people. And I think this teaching is great for Muslims, because we as Muslims, we have to admit, we often like to point at each other and tell this Muslim, oh, you're not a good Muslim. We have too many Puritans in our Muslim society, so this teaching would be very applicable to them. Do not go search for the faults of other Muslims, on, because if they do, as the Prophet said, God will look for their faults. And then another lovely teaching of the Prophet, blessed is he who preoccupies himself with his own defects rather than that of others. And as we know in today's society, as I said, people love to preoccupy themselves with the problems of other people rather than themselves. We know as humans we love blaming other people for their defects rather than our own. And then another lovely teaching of the Prophet, as he said, beware of suspicion, for suspicion is the worst of false tales. And do not look for others' as faults, and do not spy, and do not be jealous of one another, and do not cut off relations from one another, and do not hate each other, rather be brothers. Now, in today's society, I think that's a very good role model, you know, don't spy on each other, don't be jealous of each other, you know, don't hate each other. And sadly, we see that in a lot of society today. We have a lot of jealousy, a lot of greed with the high levels of materialism. I mean, I, live in, I was living in London, and if you followed the news, last summer there was a bunch of riots in London. And if you noticed, where did most of the rioters loot? They looked at the high-end stores, the Nike stores, the shoe stores. This high level of materialism makes them do such crazy things. And what about honesty and truthfulness? Something that is lacking in today's society. I mean, today, um, sometimes you never know who you can trust today. You're always uh, suspicious of if you can trust this person or not because of all the uh, deceit that is out there. But as the Prophet Muhammad taught, honesty leads to righteousness and righteousness leads to paradise. A man who remains honest and concerned about honesty until he is recorded as an honest man with God. Lying leads to sinfulness and sinfulness leads to the fire. And then the Prophet also taught, a truthful and trustworthy merchant, a businessman, will be in the company of the prophets, the very truthful and the martyrs. So even a businessman, the Prophet is putting up that stature of being honest because as we also know there's a lot of shady businessmen in today's world. And another great teaching of the Prophet concerning honesty and trust. He who does not keep his trust lacks faith, and he who does not keep his agreements lacks in religion. So according to the Prophet, if you don't keep your trust, if you're not trustworthy, if you don't keep to your promises when you make agreements, then you lack faith and you lack religion as a Muslim. So these are very strong teachings concerned about honesty and truthfulness and being against lying and deceit. Now what about the worst type of people, you know, the oppressors, the people, as I said, who oppress the innocent, they kill, they murder, you know, the likes of the Nazi Germany and the likes of the oppressive communist regimes and many other examples, you know, the dictatorship in Egypt which fell. And there's a whole list of examples. So what did the Prophet Muhammad say concerning oppressors, concerning how you should be? As the Prophet taught again in the Hadiths, show mercy to those on earth so that he who is in heaven will show mercy to you. So the Prophet is teaching his people, be merciful to one another. 
and mercy is the opposite of oppression and being mean and rough to somebody and trying to put them down. And in another hadith, the Prophet Muhammad also taught that one of the greatest sins after polytheism is to kill an innocent soul. And as we also know in the Quran, in the fifth chapter, the Quran says that anybody who kills an innocent person, it's like he killed all of mankind. <clears throat> and if he saved an innocent person, it's like he saved humanity. And then there's another great teaching of the Prophet when he said, help your brother, whether he is an oppressor or he's an oppressed. Now someone might ask, how do you help uh, someone who's an oppressor? That's what exactly the Prophet was asked. And as he answered, it, um, but how should we help him? By preventing him by committing an oppression. So that's how you help an oppressor, by stopping him committing that oppression. So the Prophet again is teaching against oppression. And that's basically a main Islamic theme in Islam. And as we also know, justice is also the opposite of oppression. Without justice, there's only oppression. And as the Quran teaches in the fourth chapter, O you who believe, stand out firmly for justice as witnesses to God, even if it is against yourself, your parents, or your relatives, whether it is against the rich or the poor. Now, as we know in society, present and past, many times people get away with justice because based on their uh, society or based on where they are in the uh, class of society. If you're rich, sometimes you can get away with something, while if you're poor, you usually get the punishment. Or if it's your relative, you'll be a bit biased. Or if it's against yourself, you'll also be biased. But the Quran is saying, stand up firmly for justice, whether it be the rich, whether it be the poor, whether it be your family, whether it be whoever. And then in the fifth chapter of the Quran, and this is another lovely teaching, O you who believe, stand out firmly for God as witnesses to fair dealings, and let not the hatred of others make you swerve from justice. So according to the Quran, even if you hate somebody, you should still show justice to them and you should not allow that hate to cloud your judgment and as we know there's a lot of people who often their judgment is clouded because they hate somebody and they not and they don't give them true justice due to their biasness but the prophet is saying even if you hate somebody show that person justice and don't show him injustice and finally another problem we face today is racism and bigotry I mean, for example, right now you have the Euro football tournament in Europe. And this is a huge sporting event. And already there have been several cases of racism happening in those football stadiums. And this is a main public mainstream event. And that's just one example. So what did the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, have to say about that? Now, as we all know, America has a rich history of the civil rights movement. But 1400 years ago, before the civil rights movement began in the 60s and late 50s, the Prophet Muhammad said, there is no superiority of an Arab over a non-Arab. And it doesn't matter if you're black or if you're white. A black person is not better than a white person and a white person is not better than a black person. And this was preached 1400 years ago, basically black or white doesn't really matter and that's a motto of today's modern society people are always talking about that yet this was revealed 1400 years ago by the Prophet Muhammad and even in the Quran what's very interesting in the Quran the Quran points to our diversity as a sign of God basically in the 30th chapter the Quran says and one of his signs is the creation of the heavens and the earth and the diversity of your tongues and your colors so basically being different cultures, being different uh, colors, being different languages, that's a sign of God that He made us so diverse. And then another uh, verse in the Quran, chapter 49, verse 13, and it says, Mankind, we created you from a male and female, and made you into peoples and tribes, so that you might know each other. So God has made us diverse, He's made us multicultural, He's made us of different races on purpose. And we shouldn't be against it, but rather we should embrace it. And even during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, 
the Arabs of his time were very tribalistic people. I mean, they were so tribalistic that if you were from a different tribe, and even though you were Arab, you'd be looked differently. So you had two groups of Arabs. You had the Ansar, and the Ansar were the helpers who were in Medina, and you had the immigrants who were from Mecca. So when the Prophet came to Medina, he united the immigrants from Mecca with the helpers from Medina, and he made them live together, one by one. So basically, a immigrant would live with an Ansar, and so forth and so forth, to get rid of that tribalism. And sometimes they would actually have arguments. The Ansar from Medina would have arguments with the immigrants from Mecca, and the Prophet would tell them, why are you reverting to this tribalism? You know, you should be united, a brotherhood. It doesn't matter um, where you're from. Don't look at it through those lenses. So I think if you put all of this together, and I mean there's so many more examples, but my time is short, but if you put all of this together, I think these examples show that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is a very good role model to modern society and the problems we face. I mean, something else I didn't mention, family. The Prophet was a very family man, and he taught the Muslims, the best of you are the best to their wives and to their family to look after your family, feed them, clothe them, etc., etc. So that's another great example of the Prophet. And as all studies have shown, a strong society starts in the home. Most gangsters, most criminals, when they do studies on them, came from broken homes, came from broken families, which led to their situation. And a strong family leads to a good person and leads to a strong society. So I'll end it on that. Thank you very much. Our next speaker, David Wood, will be giving his opening statement. Well, uh, I, I give thanks to the uh, Muslim Debate Initiative for setting up this debate and everyone for coming out. Uh, and thanks, Sammy, for that opening statement. Uh, I wish I believed a lot of that. Uh, I wish I did. Um, and just to clarify my position here at the beginning, um, you do have people out there who say Muhammad is the worst person in history, and on the opposite side of the spectrum you have people who say Muhammad is the best person in history. I believe the truth lies uh, somewhere in between, as it often does. Uh, and just to give you my overall position ahead of time, uh, I like Muhammad for about the four, first 40 years or so of his life, and for the next 10 or 12 years, okay with most of, uh, most of, uh, most of his actions and so on. And then uh, the last 10 years kind of uh, ruined everything for me. Um, I've debated the prophethood of Muhammad several times. I can say that Sammy is the best I've ever faced on this topic. We debated the prophethood of Muhammad once before. So I'm sure he'll be able to give responses to um, everything I'm about to say, whether those responses are satisfying or not, that's a different matter. But uh, as I'm about to, to share some information uh, about Muhammad and the role and the, the, the model he set, um, don't be too worried until you hear the responses, and then if you think Sammy's responses aren't very good, then you, then you can start being uh, worried. Um, I'd like to focus on a, a couple issues at first, and, and one would be if we're talking about the role model set by Muhammad. Uh, think about the role model set by Muhammad in terms of how we deal with problems. For almost every problem that uh, the Muslim community had to deal with once Muhammad became the, the model for society. Keep in mind, during the early Muslim community, during the Meccan years, during some of the uh, Medinan period, Muhammad is not the role model for society. We see Muhammad becoming the standard of society very late in Islamic history, and we see the impact that this had. Let's look at a few teachings from the Quran and the Hadith. Once Muhammad was the role model for society, Surah 929, fight those who believe not in Allah nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden which hath been forbidden by Allah and his messenger, nor acknowledge the religion of truth from among the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued. This verse doesn't say, fight people who are attacking you. That was earlier. That was a, an earlier period in Islamic history. This says, fight those who do not believe. 
This is a command to fight the unbelievers. And if you'd like to know the justification for fighting the Christians and the Jews and subjugating them, it occurs in the next verse. What's the justification for fighting them? Surah 930, and the Jews say, Ezra is the son of Allah. And the Christians say, the Messiah is the son of Allah. These are the words of their mouths. They imitate the saying of those who disbelieved before. May Allah destroy them how they are turned away. Sami talks about bigotry and racism being a problem for society. But you can have uh, bigotry in the sense of violence towards uh, other people. I mean, the kind of violent bigotry uh, against other religions. And the Quran, right here, as plain as day, commands Muslims to fight those who do not believe in Allah. Is that a good role model for society? We have Christians and Muslims in this room, probably some who don't fall into either category. Is it a good role model if we say uh, one group is going to fight and violently subjugate the others because of their beliefs? I don't think that uh, would be a good role model. If you're, if you're in doubt about what Muhammad meant there uh, in these passages commanding to fight people based on their beliefs, I'll quote a couple of hadith. Sahih al-Bukhari, number 6924, Allah's Messenger said, I have been ordered to fight the people till they say, La ilaha illallah. And whoever said, La ilaha illallah, Allah will save his property and life from me. So your property and your life are safe from Muhammad if you recite the Shahada. In Sahih Muslim, number 30, Muhammad said, I have been commanded to fight against people until when? Until they stop attacking you? Until they are no longer aggressors against you? No, I have been commanded to fight against people so long as they do not declare that there is no God but Allah. Over and over again, fight people based on what they believe. And if you want to say Muhammad meant something different, he meant uh, you should get along with everyone, or he meant you just fight in self-defense, uh, wow, the Quran claims to be clear, and Muhammad is supposed to uh, speak clearly. If he's going around and he means fight in self-defense, but he's saying fight those who do not believe, and you're only safe if you believe what I believe and you recite the Shahada, um, well, that matters, that's relevant to... Uh, to what we believe about Muhammad. On the issue of apostates, some of you are Muslims in this room. What happens if you become a Christian? Well, in the West, nothing will happen to you. Nothing will happen to you if you become a Christian or an atheist or something else. Uh, but if we adopt Muhammad as the role model for society, as Sami believes, then the rules will have to change. Sahih al Qari. Number 6922, Allah's Messenger said, whoever changed his Islamic religion, then kill him. If you leave Islam, you have to die. If that's not clear enough, Sahih al-Bukhari 6878, Allah's Messenger said, the blood of a Muslim who confesses, la ilaha illallah, and that I am the Messenger of Allah, cannot be shed except in three cases. Life for life, so you killed another Muslim, a married person who commits illegal sexual intercourse, so adultery, and the one who turns renegade from Islam, apostate, and leaves the group of Muslims. So the only way you can kill another Muslim is if he does one of those things. Notice one of them is uh, killing apostates. Sami quotes Surah 532 of the Quran uh, to show how peaceful Islam is. He uh, said, well, in Islam, if you kill someone, it's as if you killed all mankind. Now here, uh, Muslims quoting this quite a bit. Let's read it in context and see what the verse actually says, and we'll read the following verse. Interestingly, the verse Sammy quoted is, according to the Quran, a teaching of the Jews, and it actually comes uh, from Mishnah Sanhedrin in the uh, Talmud. But let's read what it actually says, 532, and then we'll go to 533. For this reason did we prescribe to the children of Israel, it's a teaching of the children of Israel, for this reason did we prescribe to the children of Israel that whoever slays a soul, unless it be for manslaughter or for mischief in the land, and read the Muslim commentaries, mischief in the land is violating any of the Jewish law. It is as though he slew all men. And whoever keeps it alive, it is as though he kept alive all men. And certainly our apostles came to them with clear arguments, but even after that, many of them certainly act extravagantly in the land. That's a teaching of the Jews. The next verse says, and here's the teaching of the Muslims. The punishment of those who wage war against Allah and his apostle and strive to make mischief in the land. What's the penalty for making mischief in the land, in the Muslim land? Is only this, that they should be murdered or crucified, or their hands and their feet should be cut off on opposite sides, or they should be imprisoned. This shall be as a disgrace for them in this world, and in the hereafter they shall have a grievous chastisement. Now notice what uh, many people do when they quote this. There's a teaching of the Jews. They chop off that part about this being for the children of Israel. 
they pretend that this is a directive towards Muslims, they ignore the next verse which commands Muslims to violently kill and chop off body parts of people who make mischief in a Muslim land. Well, how do you make mischief in a Muslim land? Apostasy, preaching a, a, a non-Muslim message, that all falls into the mischief category. The most extreme, of course, would be having a non-Muslim military presence in a Muslim country. But think about this, the, the, the penalty for making mischief in a Muslim land. Is the United States making mischief in Muslim lands? Most Muslims would say so. Yes, Afghanistan and Iraq and so on. Uh, the United States is making mischief in Muslim lands. What's the penalty? It's not pretty, not pretty. So, uh, be careful how you quote the Quran because sometimes the next verse teaches uh, something very different. So just to, to kind of get an overview there, what's, what's the solution in Islam if you have unbelievers in a Muslim country? Well, you, you, you have to subjugate them. You have to violently subjugate them if they're Christians and Jews until they are paying tribute and until they feel themselves subdued. And uh, that's for Christians and Jews. We're the people of the book. We have a higher status. If you're a, a polytheist or something, it's, uh, it's, it's worse. You have to convert or die or you have to get out very quickly. Uh, someone leaves Islam, you kill them. And if this, you can go on down the line with this. What's the penalty for, I mean, if you steal something, it's not, it's not some juvenile correction center. It's not uh, going and doing community service or short jail term. You are going to lose some limbs on this one. You're going to have your hand chopped off if you steal. Uh, if uh, your wife keeps getting out of line, what do you do? Well, you warn her first, then you, you banish her to a separate bed, and then you beat her. Over and over again, when there are problems for Muhammad, the solution involves violence. So is that a good role model for society? How are we going to deal with our problems in the world today? Well, it's got to involve some, some bloodshed or some, or some beating. This is not me. This is Muhammad talking. This is the Quran. Now, um, there are certainly other issues, but the two main categories that would, that would concern me, that, again, there are plenty of others, uh, but the two main issues that would concern me as a non-Muslim if we were to adopt Muhammad as a role model, uh, one, we have, um, we have uh, the violence, the, the tendency towards uh, violence as a solution for various problems, and two, the issues involving women and Muhammad's family. Uh, Sammy pointed out that uh, a strong family leads to a strong society, and I absolutely agree 100%. Uh, once the family unit starts breaking down, I can guarantee you society will start breaking down. Uh, the question is, should Muhammad serve as the role model for a successful family? Well, let's think about this. According to the Quran, Surah 4.3, Muslims can have up to four wives. How many wives did Muhammad have? He had at least nine. He had at least nine or eleven at one time, according to uh, Bukhari. So why did he get nine or eleven wives? Well, the Quran gave him a special revelation, Surah 33, verse 50. No, he had, he had nine. Uh, Muhammad had, according to Bukhari and according to Tabari and other sources, uh, Muhammad had at least nine wives uh, at one time. And the, the justification, and Sam, Sammy, will, Sammy will explain this, uh, the justification is Surah 3350, which gave Muhammad and Muhammad alone uh, special privileges, namely the right to have more wives than everyone else. Now, if we think about some of these wives, and trust me, Sammy will, will have responses for all of this. One of them is a girl named Aisha. This is two Westerners. This is probably one of the things that bothers them most about Muhammad, so it's good to, it's good to raise the objection and, and allow uh, Muslim uh, apologists to deal with it. Aisha was six when the marriage contract was uh, put together. And she was nine when the marriage was consummated. Now, in any Western country, at least now, you have different rules uh, in the past, but at least now we would look at that and say a nine-year-old girl is not ready for sex. And we would make laws, and there are laws against having sex with girls that young. You have to, you know, the, the laws can vary um, by country. But generally, we would agree that's too young for a girl to be entering into marriage. But if we take Muhammad as the role model for society, we have to say, when did Muhammad think it was okay for a girl to start uh, having a family and having sex? Well, nine at the latest. So should we adopt him as a role model for society? Well, if we agree with that, and uh, I, I certainly don't. Um, Muhammad had a wife named Sauda. 
Muhammad married, there's dispute whether he married uh, Aisha or Sauda um, first after Khadija. But Sauda uh, became old and unattractive after uh, several years of marriage. Aisha said she, she, uh, she was a fat, huge lady. That's a quote from Aisha. Uh, and Muhammad was going to divorce her. Uh, and Sauda actually had to go to Muhammad and say, I will, I will set aside my marital privileges of you coming and visiting, uh, sharing your time among all your wives and sharing time with me. Uh, I will give that privilege to Aisha, so you no longer have to come visit me, you can just spend more time with Aisha uh, if you don't divorce me. And Muhammad agreed to that, it's in the Quran. Uh, and the Quran actually praises Sauda for making that agreement, for saying, I will set aside some of my marital rights uh, and give them to Aisha, so you can spend more time with Aisha if you don't divorce me, because I've gotten old and unattractive. Is that a good role model for society? You live with a woman, for uh, you marry a woman, she gets older, she gets unattractive, and well, no problem, I'll just toss her to the side. Oh well, she's willing to, to stay married to me if she gives up her rights, maybe I'll stay married to her. Is that a good role model? Is that, is that a strong family? Uh, you Muslim ladies in the audience, would, would you like your husband to have that attitude? Once you get older, once you get unattractive, he tosses you to the side, and uh, the only way to, to, to make an agreement is to, to give up some of your marital rights. Is that the kind of role model you want? Um, I wouldn't consider that a good role model for society. Sammy brings up the importance of honesty. And it's interesting that in the Muslim sources, if you make an oath and then you find something better than keeping your oath, you can set aside your oath. So I made an oath, this is what I'm going to do. And then, well, I, I decided something is better. And you can, you can then break that oath. And interestingly, we find Muhammad himself doing this. There's a verse of the Quran. Uh, beginning in verse 66, so the, so the opening verses of verse 66 tell Muhammad, Muhammad, why did you forbid yourself what I haven't forbidden you? Why did you do that? And the historical background for this verse is that Muhammad was caught in the, the house of one of his wives, who was a slave girl, Mary the Copt. Uh, he was having sex with Mary the Copt in one of the houses of his other wives, Hafsa. And uh, his wives got very upset about this, and he made an oath. I promise I'm going to stop having sex with Mary the Copt. Then the revelation came down. Muhammad, why are you forbidding for yourself what I haven't forbidden? And according to uh, Surah, the opening verses of Surah 66, Muhammad no longer had to keep his oath. If you want commentaries on that, we can go. If you want to look at the historical background. Is that the kind of role model you want? Your husband comes to you. I promise you I'm not going to do this anymore. I'm not going to be sleeping with that woman anymore. I'm not married to her. She's my slave girl. And then comes back to you a little later. Uh, sorry, I just realized Allah didn't tell me I had to do that. And so it's okay for me not to keep my oath. Is that a good role model for society? I don't believe it is. The issue of mutzah. Uh, Shia Muslims believe that muta is still uh, an acceptable practice. That's uh, temporary marriage. There's a disagreement among Sunnis. Sunnis generally believe that uh, the practice is no longer allowed, but it's, it's important. It was not Muhammad who uh, overruled the practice, who abolished the practice. It was the rightly guided caliphs. So if you believe that the rightly guided caliphs can overrule uh, Muhammad's teachings, then you believe that um, mutza is no longer allowed. But regardless, everyone agrees, everyone, Sunnis and Shias agree, that at least at one time Muhammad allowed the practice of mutza, temporary marriage. In other words, um, straightforward prostitution is not allowed. I can't walk up to a woman and say, here's $50, let's go have sex, because you're not married to her. So in the early Muslim community, there was the practice of temporary marriage, namely, you walk up to a woman, here's $50, uh, let's get married for tonight, and then we'll be divorced in the morning. There's no question this was allowed in the early Muslim community. We have tons of sources on this. And even Sunni sources in Bukhari and Muslim, and if, if you'd like to read them, uh, bring it up in the Q&A, or if Samuel would like me to read them, I'd be happy to do so. But the practice of mutza was allowed. Now, do we want that as a role model for society? that if you want to have sex with someone, you're away from home, your, uh, your urges, your, 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 your dying to have sex, well, no problem. I'll go give a woman something. Um, I'll go to someone and, and they'll, they'll pronounce a quick marriage and then we get divorced the next day, I give her some money. 
If you're bothered by that, don't. That's your profit. That's your profit. In other words, if you're bothered, hey, how dare this guy say this stuff in here? Then you're agreeing with me. Actually, you're agreeing with me that Muhammad's not a good role model for society. That that should not be allowed. So, what do we have here? Um, overall, overall. And just to clarify again, I'm not saying everything Muhammad did uh, was bad. I don't believe that. I believe Muhammad did have uh, many good qualities, many qualities that could serve as a role model for society. But I would say that about pretty much anyone. Uh, I would say that about any one of you in here, you have certain qualities that would be good for other people to imitate. But you may have certain qualities, certain beliefs, certain actions that aren't good. And that's true of me. That's uh, true of pretty much everyone in the world. When we look to Muhammad, it's not a pick and choose matter. You can't say, well, I like this about him, so therefore let's proclaim him the role model for society. According to the Quran, Surah 3321, Muhammad is the role model. He is the pattern. So if Muhammad is the pattern, and you think that we should imitate him and society should model our behavior after him, you don't get to go through there and pick and choose and say, these are the things that I agree with, these are the things I like, these are the things that we should imitate in society. It's a package deal. So if you like the fact that Muhammad encouraged his followers to give to charity, great, I believe in giving to charity. But you don't get to stop at giving to charity. Muhammad also commanded his followers to kill apostates. He also commanded his followers fight the unbelievers. He also commanded his followers chop off the hands of thieves. He also commanded his followers to beat their wives if things get too out of hand. He also commanded his followers uh, to have, that they could have up to four wives, and in his case, he could actually get more. And the example he set, he's the role model. You could have sex with a nine-year-old girl. Uh, you, could, you can abandon uh, an older wife unless she comes up with a good deal for you. And if you want to have sex with, uh, with a prostitute, just make sure you marry her for the night, or marry her for a week, or marry her for, for a month. That's the example set by Muhammad. And I'm out of time, but uh, there's certainly much more we'll be discussing here, and I want to address some of uh, Sammy's other claims. But uh, I think we can say, based on these issues, that Muhammad may be a good role model in certain areas, but not certainly an overall good role model for society. The first rebuttal will be given by Sammy. You have 12 minutes. All right, uh, thank you for that. Now, there's a lot of points, so if I don't address anything, then please bring it up in the Q&A, because I have answers to all of the points. All right, so let's start with the first point he made, which is uh, 929, Surah 929. Fight them until they all believe and subdue them and make them pay the jizya. Now, this verse was revealed in a specific context, and now this is not even me talking, this is what even Islamic scholars teach, so I'm not just talking from myself. This verse was revealed during a time when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was sending out messengers and ambassadors to the northern Arab states, which were basically under the Byzantine Empire, who were Christians. And so what did they do? They killed those messengers. Now. Think of it this way, let's say America sent a diplomat to Iran and Iran killed that diplomat. What, what do you think would happen? There would be a massive war. And so that's what happened. Then you also had another incident which was the campaign of Tabuk, which again is in northern Arabia. The Prophet Muhammad got intelligence reports that the Byzantines were planning to gather at the north and to invade the Arabian Peninsula. So after all of these hostile and provocative acts by the Byzantines, Surah 929 was revealed to fight these people. Muslims now had the mandate to fight back and to, if, uh, and to also defeat the Byzantines. So that is the context of Surah 929. It was revealed in that specific context, a context of war and battle. And then the second point about, he brought up hadiths where the Prophet said, fight the people until they recite the Shahada. Fight everybody until they declare uh, the Shahada. Now, why do we know that his interpretation is wrong? Forget about anything, look at the, uh, look at the ground facts. The Prophet made treaties with Christians. There were Christians living under the Prophet in Northern Arabia. They weren't, they weren't declaring the Shahada, they were declaring a trinity. And yet they were not being fought. 
So obviously there is more to it. So these hadiths, as even the great Islamic scholars have said, Ibn Taymiyyah, and Ibn Taymiyyah is considered like an extremist scholar. So what did he have to say about this hadith? According to him, this hadith is about fighting back. It's about a war. What about Imam Nawawi? Anybody who knows uh, scholars will know Imam Nawawi is a great Islamic scholar. And according to him, this verse or these hadiths were referring to the pagan Arabs. It is not a general mandate. And secondly, there is a verse in the Quran that is actually quite similar to these hadiths. It says, fight them until there is no more oppression and all faith is for Allah. But now if anyone reads that verse, the context of that verse was referring to the pagans, was referring in a context of war. And that verse is identical to this hadith, and that verse was revealed in a context, revealed in a context of war. So there's more to it. And again, you can ignore everything I said, but you can't ignore the fact that there were Christians living under the Muslims. So obviously they didn't fight them until they all converted. I mean, some of the oldest Christian populations are located in Muslim countries. Some of the oldest churches are located in Muslim countries. I mean, outside Israel, the second country with the most Jewish sites is the Islamic Republic of Iran, who according to some people is Nazi Germany, yet they have the second largest Jewish population there, and they've been there for hundreds of years. So obviously, it's not as simple as he's making it out to be. Now what about apostates, the apostate issue? Again, you need to look at it in context. I mean, there is an example in the Hadiths where a Muslim went back on his agreement with the Prophet, and he said, you know what, I'm leaving you, I'm uh, getting you. They made an agreement, they made a covenant, and the man told the Prophet, I'm going to leave. And the Prophet didn't kill him. He let him go. Now, every time, back then, back in the context, apostates were regularly spies. They were regularly um, infiltrators who would then turn against the Muslims and fight back. As David even quoted, renegades. Now, most people say there's no verse in the Quran that talks about fighting apostates. Actually, there's one. And that verse supports me. In Surah 4, verse 89, the Quran commands the Muslims to fight the renegades, the apostates. But what is the context of this verse? Ibn Abbas, anyone who knows Ibn Abbas, he was a uh, relative of the Prophet. He's one of the greatest uh, commentators of the Quran. What did he have to say about fighting the apostates? This is what he said. This verse was revealed about some people in Mecca who said they embraced Islam, yet they gave their support to the pagans in Mecca. Once these people went to Mecca, they sat with the pagans, and once they were with the Muslims, they said, we'll help the Muslims. And basically, they were playing both sides. And these were apostates. So they were not simply uh, apostates who decided to leave the religion because they lost faith. These were people who were pretending to be Muslims, they would uh, leave the religion, then they would go to the pagans, then they would come to the Muslims. And there's even another example in Sahih Bukhari. A non-Muslim spy came to the Prophet while he was on a journey. The spy sat with the companions of the Prophet and started talking and then went away. He acted like he was a Muslim, but he was just there to spy. Then you have another incident. You had the tribe of Okal incident. This is what happened. These people came to the Muslims and they were sick, they needed help, and they converted to Islam. So the Prophet helped them. He let some Muslims help them, you know, they looked after them. Once the Muslims looked after those people, those people killed the Muslims by literally burning their eyes and stealing everything they had. And those were apostates. So when you look at it in, at it in context, that's the apostates, that's the issue. Those were how apostates were back then. And these are all Islamic texts. So again, it's not just that simple. If you're an apostate, it's the end. What about the uh, teaching to the Jews? The one I quoted, uh, if you kill one innocent person, it's like you killed all of humanity. Yes, that teaching was given to the Jews, but the Quran is reminding us of it. The Quran didn't abrogate it and say, oh yeah, that was for the Jews only. Now you don't have to follow it. I mean, the Qur'an teaches monotheism, which was also taught to the Jews. 
Does that mean now we don't follow monotheism? No, it's just confirming a great teaching that was given to them that now we will follow. And yes, the next verse does say, those who wage war and mischief should be uh, killed and crucified. But that's talking not about innocent people. The verse before it is talking about innocent people. But if you're not an innocent person, yes, that might sound harsh, but what does making mischief mean? No, it doesn't mean uh, being a non-Muslim. Scholars have defined it. Making mischief in the land are basically like your criminals, like your gangsters. People who are uh, bandits, people who are uh, thieves, people who are rapists, terrorists, etc., etc. Those are the type of people, the mischief makers. And yes, in the Islamic State, those people will be harshly punished. And in fact, there's many people in the West who would agree for such harsh punishment on file backward criminals. I mean, the justice system in the West has gotten so soft that you find these people doing whatever they feel like. So I doubt many people will have a problem in properly punishing criminals. That's what the verse is talking about. Criminals to protect innocent people. It's not talking about innocent people. That's what you have to keep in mind. What about the issue of beating your wife? Well, if anyone reads the Arabic, the word doesn't actually mean beater and puncher. It just means hit. Now, this is not my opinion. As David says, now this is the prophet speaking. When the prophet explained it, he said it's a hit that doesn't even cause any pain. His relative, Ibn Abbas, also described it as causing no pain, causing no bruising. And as ladies know, ladies bruise quite easily. It doesn't, you can, it, with a man's force, she bruises easily. And the prophet is saying, don't bruise her, don't cause any pain. So it's not really to beat or hurt her. And that's not my opinion, that is Islamic scholarship and the prophet Muhammad himself. So it's not uh, punching her and beating her and uh, causing her pain. And the prophet even said, the worst of the Muslims are those who cause harm to their wives. I mean, the Quran even says, don't mistreat your wives. Don't keep them against their will. Be kind and uh, soft with them, nice and so forth. So again, you have to look at it in context. And David then said, in Islam, the solution is always violence. You know, retaliate, be bad. No, it isn't. Because in my opening, I brought you hadiths which said, if someone is bad to you, don't be bad to them. And it's good to forgive people and so forth. So it's not always about violence. Now, what about the Prophet having uh, 9 to 11 wives? Yes, he had extra wives, but if you look at the wives, there was always a specific context. Some of them were widows, so he was making an example to the Muslims. Remember, I said in my opening, Islam has a high emphasis on widows. Secondly, a lot of these wives were, were from warring tribes, and back then, if you married into a tribe, you would become a family, and that would end the war. There was one case when the Prophet married a lady from a warring tribe who were defeated by the Muslims, and thanks to the marriage, all her people were freed as a result of the marriage, and they had peace. The third category of wives, the Prophet used to marry uh, the daughters of his close companions, thereby uh, making their bond even stronger and making them family, such as Abu Bakr, such as Omar, and these men became the caliphs of Islam. So the Prophet is making a bond with the people who will continue the message of Islam. So that makes perfect sense. And as for uh, Sauda, there is no hadith that says the Prophet was going to divorce Sauda. Sauda went to the Prophet and gave this recommendation that I'll give my time to Aisha. But there was no hadith where the Prophet said, oh yeah, you know what, you're fat, you're ugly, and I want to divorce you. That hadith does not exist. And that was two more points. Uh, you can break your oath for something better. It doesn't mean you go back on your oath. It means you do something better. Like if I say I'm going to take you with a car, but then I take you with a plane or something like that. And what about temporary marriage? Muslims, Sunni Muslims don't follow temporary marriage. It was revealed in a specific context. These were early Muslims who were still not used to being uh, chaste only to their wives and so forth and so forth. So this was a specific limited time that was given to them as a dispensation or something. They were still new Muslims. I mean, after all, alcohol was allowed for the early Muslims until it was eventually abrogated. And my time's up, and I think those are all his points.
Thank you. Thank you. The first rebuttal will be given by David Wood. Well, Sammy, uh, I'll just go through his points. Sammy said that Surah 929 only referred to uh, fighting some s certain people who had killed uh, messengers. Well, the killing of messengers was much, much earlier, and in the historical context, it had nothing to do with this command. I'll also point out that uh, if this really means just kill a particular group who is who killed your messengers, it is horribly unclear. The Quran claims over and over and over again, like a beating drum, to be clear. It's clear. It's fully detailed. It's fully explained. Those are things the Quran says about itself. So if it had been revealed to Muhammad, fight people who had killed your messenger, why didn't it say, fight some people who killed your messenger? Why wouldn't it say, why would it say, fight those who believe not in Allah? And why would the very next verse give the justification for the killing as, the Christians say that Jesus is the Son of God? Why would that be the justification? Why would it be? It's because they killed a messenger. In other words, if you're telling me this verse means something other than what it says, then you're telling me the Quran is a very, very unclear book. Now, the actual historical context, let's read it. This comes from Ibn Kathir. Allah Most High ordered the believers to prohibit the disbelievers from entering or coming near the sacred mosque. So polytheists were no longer allowed near the sacred mosque, but Mecca got a lot of money from, uh, from the pilgrimage to uh, Mecca. So people were worried how they were going to make money. Let's read. On that, Quraysh thought that they would reduce their profits from trade. Therefore, Allah Most High compensated them and ordered them to fight the people of the book until they embrace Islam or pay the jizya. And then we have the revelations. So in its context in the Quran, the only context that explains why this fighting occurred, why Muslims are commanded to fight the people of the book, is the very next verse, and it says, because of our beliefs, we have false beliefs. In the historical context, the justification is, uh, we need money, where are we going to get it? Oh, well, now we're going to fight these unbelievers, and they're going to pay us money. That's going to replace the money that we used to get from the pagans taking the pilgrimage. Nothing here about what Sammy said. Sammy said that the, the hadith, the numerous hadith, where Muhammad commands his followers uh, to fight people until they recite the shahada, he says, well, you know, that's in the context of war. Again, I would say Muhammad is very unclear in what he's saying. If he really means, let's go fight people in the context of war, why not say, let's fight people in the context of war? Why say, I'm going to go out and fight people until they recite the shahada? And they're only going to be safe. People are only going to be safe for me if they do. Uh, he says this referred to pagan Arabs. Actually, I don't have a tremendous problem with that interpretation. If you say that the command to, for Jews and Christians is to fight them until they're subjugated, until they're dimmies, uh, and that the command for other groups, polytheists, is to fight them until they uh, convert to Islam and um, uh, uh, embrace Islam, then I, I don't have a problem with, with that interpretation. Um, he said killing apostates is only... They, the, the command to kill apostates was was only issued because all of these apostates would go and turn against the Muslim community. Here again, I would say, if that's what Muhammad meant, he is not communicating very clearly. If he meant, fight an apostate if he attacks you, why would he say, if anyone, not just a certain person, if anyone leaves his Islamic religion, then kill him? I mean, these are commands about killing people. You want to be as clear as possible. If the President of the United States were to issue a command and say, hey, go kill Muslims, everyone would object. Wait, you, what do you mean, go kill Muslims? We're just supposed to go around killing Muslims? And then he came, suppose he came back and clarified and said, no, I just met you know, some terrorists who were blowing stuff up from Al-Qaeda. Wouldn't you say, look, if you mean terrorists who are working for Al-Qaeda, you need to say that. You need to say exactly what you mean if you're talking about killing people. That's the clarity we would demand. Why does Muhammad get to issue these blanket commands? If anyone leaves Islam, kill him. Oh, by the way, uh, I really meant if he uh, comes back and is starting to attack the Muslim community. Didn't say that. So if, if either way, you have two alternatives. Either Islam commands you to kill apostates, in which case, not a good role model, or Muhammad is not a very good communicator, in which case we should adopt a role model who speaks clearly and tells us uh, how we should act. Um, on the issue of women, 
Sammy says, well, the beating, the beating isn't supposed to cause a woman pain. It's not supposed to leave any bruises, not supposed to hurt them. And here, I'm not sure what Sammy, uh, you, d you do have things, you do have Muslim commentators who, who say things like that. But if we look to the Muslim sources, we see something very different. Sahih Muslim, number 2127, Aisha sneaks out of the house to see what Muhammad's doing. Uh, Muhammad comes home. Uh, finds her out of breath, asks her what she's done, and then what happened? He struck me on the chest, which caused me pain. Wait a minute, I, this is Aisha saying what Muhammad did. He struck me on the chest, which caused me pain. I thought Sammy said it's not supposed to cause pain. So was Muhammad violating his own commands in Surah uh, 434? Uh, let's go with a more extreme example. Sahih al-Bukhari, number 4825. A woman had been beaten by her husband until a patch of her skin turned green. Aisha brings her to Muhammad for justice. Aisha brings her to Muhammad. Muhammad will, Muhammad will protect this woman. And Aisha said, look at her. Her skin is greener than her clothes. Muhammad did a little investigation and said, wait a minute. You lied about your husband. Sent her away. So what is this? Keep in mind, she's lying about her husband. So she had done something wrong. But is Sammy's interpretation of 434 correct? You can't leave a mark, you can't cause pain. No, he beat her until her skin turned green and that was okay because she was being a bad wife. So we need to keep in mind when we, uh, when we read the Quran, when we read these verses, we have lots of ahadith on these passages to explain what they mean for us. And in fact, if you'd like to know the, the historical background for Surah 434, we have that. Uh, a woman came up to Muhammad because her husband had slapped her in her face. The handprint was still there. And Muhammad was about to pronounce judgment in her favor. In other words, there was going to be some sort of retaliation. I don't know what that would have been. If she gets to slap him in the face or, you know, her, her dad gets to come and just slap the taste out of this guy's mouth. I don't know. But uh, then the revelation, Surah 434, comes down. And Muhammad said after this, after this verse, uh, husbands can discipline their wives physically. Muhammad said, I wanted one thing, but Allah wanted another. In other words, I wanted to give you justice. I wanted to make sure this isn't going to happen again, but sorry, Allah said something else. Marrying extra wives. Sammy says, well, they, uh, there were widows. That, that's true, there were widows. Uh, but I want to point out, if you say that Muhammad married these women because some of them were widows, Muhammad only increased the problem radically because he, the Quran issued a command, you cannot marry Muhammad's wives after he dies. So you take someone like Aisha, she's nine years old when uh, the marriage is consummated, she's 18 years old when Muhammad dies, Aisha spent the rest of her life as a widow because no one was allowed to marry Muhammad's wives. So all of these women were widows after Muhammad died. So if the point was to stop the, keep, protect these women from being widows, it, I'd say it failed and only increased the problem. You ended up with a lot of widows who could never remarry. Muhammad said, I mean, uh, Sammy said Muhammad married the daughters of his close companions to strengthen his bond with them. Is this a good role model for society? That's the context of this debate. Uh, I have my friend Paul back there. Uh, maybe Paul has a daughter a few years from now, and I say, Paul, you know, we're good buddies. We need to strengthen our, our, our friendship. I'd like to marry your six-year-old daughter. Is that a good role model for society? I don't think anyone in here would say that's a practice we need to adopt in our country. And yet, if we say Muhammad is the role model, Sammy said that's why he did it. I don't agree that that's why he did it, but if that's the justification for marrying Aisha, then is that the role model we want to follow? I would say no. Sammy pointed out that uh, in the passages, in the passages that we would normally turn to dealing with, with the Sauda issue, it doesn't say Muhammad went to her and said, I'm going to divorce you, and then they came up with a deal. I agree. Uh, it says Sauda feared. So if, if, you, if you want the justification for this passage, it doesn't say Muhammad ran out to divorce her. It said Sauda feared divorce. Muhammad wasn't uh, treating her the same way anymore, apparently. But Sauda feared this man is about to divorce me. So she goes to Muhammad and says, look, let's make a deal. Don't divorce me, and I'll give my marital rights and privileges of visitation to Aisha. Now, so, suppose we grant that, that Muhammad wasn't going to divorce her. Let's suppose Muhammad gave no indication that he was going to divorce Sauda. Suppose you have a wife and she comes to you and she thinks you're going to leave her. She thinks you're going to abandon her. 
and she says to you, please don't abandon me. I'll give my marital privileges to someone else. Just please don't leave me. Please don't take away my home. Please don't take away my food. She says that to you. What's your response going to be? Good deal, I agree. Or, what do you mean? I will never abandon you. Why would I abandon you? You're my wife. I will take care of you until you die. Which one of those should we adopt as a role model for society? Where you are loyal to your wife until, uh, until one of you dies? Or, where your wife is so afraid that you're going to divorce her that when she comes to you with a deal, you say, good deal. According to Muhammad's example, if your wife is scared that you're, you're going to abandon her, she comes to you with a deal, you should say, okay, cool, good deal. Maybe I wasn't even going to divorce you, but now that you offered, uh, yeah, I would like to spend more time with Aisha. If you don't like any of this, this is Muhammad. This is Muhammad. If you don't like any of these things, then what's that mean? It means you're agreeing with me that Muhammad is not a good role model. Sammy said, well, breaking oaths is okay if you agree to do something better. Now, I'm going to take you by a car. Well, maybe I take you by a plane. That's better. That's not what Surah 61 says. It's not what it says. Where it says you don't have to do this because, uh, because Allah didn't command it. This is Muhammad making an oath to his wives. I'm not going to continue sleeping with this slave girl, Mary the Copt. I have uh, 11 wives, 9 wives, something like that. I'm not going to continue sleeping with my slave girls. And then comes back, sorry, Allah didn't tell me that I was not allowed to sleep with the slave girl. I'm going to continue the practice. That's What's the better thing? What's the better thing that Muhammad is doing there? The only better thing that he's doing in the context would have to be he's sleeping with the slave girl instead of that's better than what he made an oath to do. And I don't think that's a better example. Uh, Sammy said that temporary marriage was only for a time. So notice he agrees, and, and any Muslim scholar will agree, that, that temporary marriage, paying a woman for to marry you for the night, was allowed in early Islam. The only dispute would be uh, whether it's still allowed today. And again, you'd have to believe that the rightly guided caliphs can overrule Muhammad. And some of the sources, uh, some of the even Sunni sources, would say no. But does that make it better? Keep in mind, Muhammad allowed the practice. Muhammad allowed the practice, and not we're not asking did the rightly guided are the rightly guided caliphs a good role model. We're asking is Muhammad a good role model, and Muhammad allowed Mutta. So if you think he's a good role model, that's up to you. The second rebuttal will be given by Sammy. You have ten minutes. Thanks. Uh, I'll start with what's fresh in your mind, the issue of muta. It was, yeah, it was allowed for a time. And no, I have no problem with it. Those, those people were a bunch of people who were fornicators. They used to indulge in large amount of alcohols. So obviously you're not going to be able to reform those people just like that. It was a slow process. So for a while they were given some, some leeway until they could adjust their lives and their settings. And secondly, it was the Prophet who banned Mut'a, and it was the companions, Omar, who continued it. Back then, people didn't have hotmail or internet services, so sometimes the message wouldn't get across. Islam had spread to vast amount of lands, so maybe it was still not clear, so the caliphs simply made it more clear. So it was banned during the lifetime of the Prophet, and the Prophet and his companions continued that ruling. And again, as to Sauda, again, the Prophet was never going to divorce Sauda. Now David says um, Sauda was scared that she was going to become uh, divorced and no food, no home. Why? In Islam there is an alimony in the first place, just to get rid of that. Even if she was divorced, she wouldn't be homeless, she wouldn't be without food, she'd actually have a shelter for a year and more. So that's, Islam had an alimony before the modern legal system. And yes, she said you can spend more time with the Prophet, but not because the Prophet asked for it. So maybe the Prophet did want to spend time with Aisha, but he was kind enough to never tell her anything, and he never was going to bring it up. But she was probably worried, and she came up with it, and yes, he wanted to spend some more time with it, not because he uh, wanted to divorce her, but he simply agreed. There is nothing bad about it. So she was never going to get divorced. She came up with this stipulation. He still spent time with her. She still remained one of his wives. And there is really no case. What about getting married to create strong bonds? 
Now, it's not as simple as saying, hey, uh, my friend, I want to marry your daughter. But even if I did want to marry your daughter to create stronger bonds, what's wrong with that? Is, is that a problem? If I wanted to, uh, ma if someone is suitable for marriage and he wants to marry your daughter and you're good friends, um, there's not really a big problem if they can do it. But again, the context is different. These were the first stages of Islam. The Prophet was marrying into the families of his closest companions who were going to continue the message of Islam after him. So he was creating strong bonds with the Caliphs of Islam, the people who would continue the message of Islam. So it's a much different uh, situation and context. And yes, he married widows to be an example to the Muslims, and so that point remains. And yes, his wives couldn't marry after him, but they were given the choice to divorce at one point, and they didn't. And secondly, the reason why they're not allowed to uh, marry afterwards is in case they get pregnant and then there might be complications. Oh, he's, uh, this is the wife of the Prophet, so maybe now this son of uh, the former wife might somehow be uh, divine or something like that. And the first point about Aisha, I didn't address it in my first rebuttal. Yes, the Prophet married Aisha at a young age, but in Islam, the, there is no actual age of marriage. The way the marriage is determined is if she's physically ready and mentally ready. Now, obviously, in today's society, uh, nine-year-old girls, ten-year-old girls are not mentally fit for marriage. So, no, we would not uh, do that. And Islamic scholars have said the same thing. So, she has to be mentally and physically ready. Back then, some girls were mentally ready for marriage at a young age. Not just in Arabia, not just with Muslims, but for Jews and Christians and in the West included. Anybody who studies history will see that. And I know it might be surprising, the first time I saw it, I was surprised. But then I did a little research and I saw it was something normal. And I was 16 back then, so if I could do it back then, then everyone can. Now what about 929? It doesn't say just fight the messengers who got killed. Exactly. 929 is a mandate to fight anyone who's now oppressing you or doing anything bad to you. Whether it, it's killing your messenger, whether it's trying to invade you. If there is hostility, 929 is the mandate for the Islamic State to fight back and defend itself. What about fight the unbelievers? Why doesn't it say in a context of war? Why does it say about faith? Simple, because it was a war of faith. The pagans were trying to wipe Islam out. So the objective is to make Islam victorious because they're trying to wipe it out. It's not about borders or oil. And secondly, the Quran says if they stop fighting, then you cease. And again, back to the point. Christian communities lived under the Islamic State. They lived under the Prophet Muhammad. So obviously the explanation is not as simple as saying, oh, they're unbelievers. We must fight them until they uh, all convert. What about apostates? Why was it spoken generally? Why didn't it say kill these specific types of apostates? Because it didn't have to be said. As I said, the context back then, this was the norm. And I gave you so many examples, and there's more examples. When apostate happened, he would uh, fight against the Muslims, he would be a spy. That was the norm. So that's why there didn't have to be any uh, clarifications. And as for the point about the Prophet Muhammad, he struck Aisha. I know that hadith he's talking about, but that's actually a wrong translation. If you read the Arabic, it doesn't say he struck her. It's actually he uh, rubbed her chest. And he did that to another man in a similar incident. He wasn't uh, striking her or hitting her. And that's the Arabic as well. Yes, there was some pain, but that wasn't the intention to cause pain. And again, the Prophet did it to another man, the same exact act. It's not an act of uh, hitting someone or violence. And again, the Arabic doesn't say struck. And as for beating, causing bruises, a lady came to the Prophet and she was bruised, and the Prophet said, well, you lied to her. Uh, the Prophet didn't say, well, you lied to her, so you could beat her and cause her bruises. And again, back to the other point. The Prophet clearly said in Islamic sources, do not hit that causes pain. Ibn Abbas, the Prophet's relative, one of the greatest commentators of the Quran, said the hitting is light, it doesn't cause bruises, it doesn't cause pain, so that point remains. 
and um, I think those are, and yeah, the point about the oaths, Surah 61 is a different case than the Hadith she's saying, if you find an oath, do something better. The Prophet was awarded a privilege, which he didn't take, and then God reminded him of the privilege. Now there's nothing wrong with that, even in the Old Testament, Prophets were given certain privileges. But anyway, I explained the reasoning for the marriages, so there's no need to go over that again, and those were basically all the points. The second rebuttal will be given by David. You have 10 minutes. All right. Uh, Sammy, thank you for that, Sammy. Um, Sammy said that Mutza was allowed because the early converts to Islam were used to having lots of sex and it would have been very difficult for them to just stop and therefore Muhammad allowed them to continue practicing Mutza. Well, are you telling me that this is, this is the example? Because that would apply today, right? Lots of people in the West, in America, they're used to having lots of sex. So, uh, when they convert to Islam, do you, do you give them a break because that's what they're used to? Do you say, hey, I know you're having lots of sex, so you can engage in mutza for a couple of years until you, you, know, until you wind down, and then you, have to, then you have to be chased. Is that what Islam teaches? Because according to what Sami told us, and according to what we read in the Muslim sources, that's exactly what Muslims should teach. That should, if we follow Muhammad as the pattern of society, then we should say, if you convert to Islam, you can practice temporary marriage, a form of prostitution that involves getting married for a day or two or something like that. Uh, you can engage in that. You can do that. That's the example set by Muhammad. So do you believe that's a good pattern for society? If you agree with Muhammad, you have to say yes. You have to say that's okay. Now, Sammy says that uh, Muhammad was the one who outlawed the practice. Well, I disagree. According to the Muslim sources, and I have several more, but I'll just read uh, a couple right here. Uh, Jabir Abdullah came to perform Umrah, and we came to his abode, and the people asked him, about different things, and then they made mention of temporary marriage, whereupon he said, yes, we had been benefiting ourselves by temporary marriage during the lifetime of the Holy Prophet and during the time of Abu Bakr and Umar. So when did it end? So, so if we're following the timeline here, it was allowed during Muhammad's time, then allowed during Abu Bakr's time, and uh, at least some practice of it during Umar's time. Uh, Next hadith, uh, number 3249. This is not Muhammad talking, this is Muslims talking about history. We contracted temporary marriage, giving a handful of flour as a dower in the time of Muhammad. Notice what you would pay a woman for having this temporary marriage. You give her a handful of flour, of, of food. We contracted temporary marriage by giving a handful of flour during the lifetime of Allah's Messenger and during the time of Abu Bakr until Umar forbade it. Until Umar forbade it. So who outlawed Mutza? Well, that's Umar. So I'll leave this up to you Muslims. If you believe in following the rightly guided caliphs of Sunni Islam, then you would have to say it's outlawed today. But if you don't believe the prophet, I mean, the, the rightly guided caliphs can overrule uh, Muhammad, you have to say it's still allowed. Uh, so what do we have here? At the very least, at the very least, if we ask ourselves, is this a good role model for society, you have a decision to make. Uh, if you believe that's an okay practice, then you can say Muhammad is a good role model. If you say that people who convert to Islam, or people in general, should be chased, even if they're used to having sex in the past, they need to stop doing that, then you're saying Muhammad is not a good role model for society, and you're agreeing with me. Sammy said that uh, Sauda didn't have to fear uh, being abandoned because she would have been compensated. Well, she certainly didn't want uh, to be divorced for some reason, so she was going to be losing something, that wasn't the point. Whatever, whatever she was afraid of losing by being divorced by Muhammad, the correct response of Muhammad should have been, if he had no intentions of divorcing her, the correct response should have been, what are you talking about? I made a commitment to you, I'm never going to abandon you. That would have been a good role model for society. But saying, okay, uh, I'm reducing your privileges because you've agreed to do that, uh, I don't consider that a good role model. Sammy says that the, the, the issue of Aisha is okay because a girl has to be mentally and physically ready. Where do you get the idea that Aisha was 
mentally and physically ready. According to the Muslim sources, when she was taken to Muhammad's house, she was playing with a swing, and she took her dolls to Muhammad's house. I mean, that sounds like a normal nine-year-old little girl. Where do you get this idea that, that she was a young woman? Not from the Muslim sources. You get that from, from, from your own views today. Um, and besides this, if you go to uh, Surah 65, verse 4 of the Quran, you find very clearly that Muslims are allowed to uh, marry prepubescent girls, and there's just no question that prepubescent girls are not ready for marriage. It's not, you're not ready for that. Medically, physically, you're not ready for marriage. You're not ready for sexual intercourse. You're not ready to start working on a family if, you, if your body has not reached the stage of puberty. Now, Surah 929, Sammy says, is a mandate to fight oppressors. Surah 929 is a mandate to fight oppressors. Well, remember the Quran says over and over again, over and over again, that the Quran is clear. Let's read it. I'll go ahead and read the entire context of the passage, and you're going to see what the problem is. You're going to see there's nothing in here about fighting oppressors, but let's don't, don't take my word for it. Take the word of the Quran for it. Um, so we're, we'll, we'll read Surah 9, starting at verse 20, and we'll keep going, and you'll, you'll, see, you'll see the problem with Sammy's interpretation. Fight those who believe not in Allah. Tell me where the oppression occurs. Tell me where the oppression starts. Fight those who believe not in Allah, nor the last day, nor hold that forbidden, which has been forbidden by Allah's as messenger. So if you don't forbid the same things that Islam forbids, um, nor acknowledge the religion of truth, if you do not acknowledge uh, Islam, from among the people of the book, that's Jews and Christians, until they pay the jizya with willing submission and feel themselves subdued, until they feel subjugated. Nothing about fight oppressors there. Fight people based on their beliefs, based on uh, the things they allow, based on them not acknowledging Islam as the religion of truth. Next verse. The Jews call Ezra son of God, and the Christians call Christ the son of God. That is a saying from their mouth, in this they but imitate what the, old, what the unbelievers of old used to say, Allah's curse be on them, how, are they, how they are deluded away from the truth. Where's the part about these people oppressing the Muslims? Maybe it's in the next verse. They take their priests and their rabbis to be their lords in derogation of Allah, and they take as their Lord Christ, the son of Mary, yet they were commanded to worship but one God, there is no God but He, still complaining about their religious practices. Where is the part about these people being oppressors? Praise and glory to him, far as he from having the partners they associate with him. Maybe it's in the next verse. Fain would they extinguish Allah's light. Here we go. Maybe they're be oppressing Muslims by extinguishing God's light, and extinguishing God's light refers to them attacking the Muslim community. Now let me finish the sentence and see what this actually says. Fain would they extinguish Allah's light with their mouths. This is talking about people speaking different religious beliefs than Muslims. They would extinguish Allah's light with their mouths, but Allah will not allow but that his light should be perfected, even though the unbelievers may detest it. Allah is not going to allow them to stop the truth from spreading. How is he going to stop them? Next verse. It is he who hath sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth to prevail it over all religion, even though the pagans may detest it. So, the solution to what these people are saying is to send Islam and to make Islam superior to every other religion, to make it prevail over all, all other religions. How is Allah going to make Islam prevail? That's why we read Surah 929, fight those who do not believe in Allah. So where in the entire context of this passage do we read anything about fighting oppressors? There's not one word. There is a steady series of complaints. These people believe things that Muslims don't believe. They don't believe in the truth. They don't acknowledge the truth. They have religious practices that we forbid, and they're speaking a message that we disagree with. Those are all of the justifications for fighting where do you get the idea that this refers to oppressors? If you believe it refers to oppressors, uh, you have to agree that the Quran is remarkably unclear. Um, Sammy says, well, the Quran says, if they stop fighting, you cease. That, well, if you, want to train, if you want to go with that interpretation of it, it would depend on your interpretation of the word uh, fitna. Uh, but I'll grant, I'll grant that. I'll grant that. Surah uh, 2, verse 193 says, uh, says something along those lines. But guess what? Read the passages that talk about if people don't fight you, you don't fight them. Those were abrogated according to your own Muslim commentators. Muslims have a process of abrogation. Later commands abrogate or cancel earlier revelations. 
Surah 9 was the last major chapter revealed, and it commands Muslims to fight and subjugate non-Muslims, which would be the pattern if you agree with, uh, with Muhammad. Sami says, we don't need to clarify the killing of apostates, because people would have understood that it only referred to uh, killing people if they go start a war against you. Well, we need clarification, don't we? Isn't this a religion for all time? Isn't this, uh, aren't we supposed to be able to read these teachings even today and understand what they mean? Over and over and over again, Muhammad says, if they leave Islam, chop their heads off. If they return to Kufr, kill them. If that means kill people who go out and start a war against you, I really wish he would have said that. It could have saved lots of lives, and the all four schools of uh, Sunni uh, jurisprudence would have concluded something very different from what they did conclude, and that they all concluded that if someone leaves Islam, they have to die. Right? I'm out of time, but I'll continue some of the other responses in the next rebuttal. The third rebuttal will be given by Sami. You have eight minutes. All right. The first point he brought up was, what about now? If someone converts to Islam now and he's a fornicator or he likes to drink a lot, should he also be given leeway? Uh, no, he doesn't get. He's not given leeway, but he is. Uh, he's not being that. We're not that rough on him. He starts out easily, but it doesn't mean he can drink. But now, why is it that the first Muslims had leeway and Muslims today, converts, won't have that exact same leeway? It's very simple. Those first Muslims were the first Muslims. They would be what Islam would be built upon. They were the backs of Islam at the time. So obviously, they would have some different regulations for them. So it would be, it would be more excusable to them because early Islam wanted to create the best possible Muslim Islamic community because if you want to start something su successful you'd have to have a strong foundation and a strong group of followers so that's why they were given more leeway and that's perfectly logical and sensible now again back to Muda in the hadiths it states clearly that Muda was banned during the battle of Khaybar so was donkey meat as well. Now why is it that some people were still uh, taking part in muta? Simple. Maybe they didn't get the message. Maybe they didn't get that specific regulation. Maybe they didn't understand it yet. Not understand it. Maybe they, it didn't reach them. It's that simple. These people were not living in a time where they had uh, modern communication systems as we do. And so some of them were still uh, partaking in that act and Omar eventually put an end to it. So it's, it's that simple. And again, that's the hadith. It was banned by the Prophet during the Battle of Khaybar. So that was during the Prophet's lifetime. And again, with Sauda, the Prophet did not want to divorce Sauda. True, maybe she thought she's going to get divorced. Now, as we all know, sometimes women, they think a lot about these things. Oh, I'm fat, maybe he doesn't like me. And she's married to the Prophet, so she's not married to any man, so she probably even got more worried because this is a great man and look at me but it never came up and she gave him that right and again if the prophet didn't want to be with this woman period he'd say i don't want to be with you at all I, even if you're giving me this much amount of time i don't want you at all but he never did that he still spent time with her and as for aisha how do we know aisha was mentally ready because she was one of the closest wives to the Prophet. After he died, she was still a young lady, and she became a great scholar of Islam. She even led men into a battle. So all of these uh, indicate that she was very ready, and she wasn't harmed at all, and there were no bad side effects. Surely if she was uh, oppressed or abused, we would find her being uh, mentally scarred, and so forth and so forth. Yet Aisha, anyone who studies her history, would know that she was a very strong lady. And what about the point, Muslims can marry girls before puberty? That needs to be explained. That's a pre-arranged marriage. It's not an official marriage. So basically, once the girl is ready for the marriage, once she's physically and mentally ready, then she will have a choice whether she wants to go through with the official marriage. So it doesn't mean that you can now go marry a child if she's not ready. And that's how Islamic scholarship has understood it. Now what about Surah 929? 
David simply wants to throw out all Islamic methodology and say, well, it doesn't say that in the Quran. Well, that's not simple Islamic methodology. In Islamic methodology, we have the Quran, we have the Sunnah, we have the Hadiths, we have the Tafsir, all of it put together. You don't just say, oh, well, that's it. There is a context that explains the revelations, and it all comes together. And when you look at it in context by Islamic methodology, the context was during a time of war. And yes, it's talking about non-believers. The Byzantines were Christians who did want to extinguish the light of Islam. That's why they were killing the messengers. That's why they were planning to uh, invade the Arabian Peninsula. So it actually fits into the context. And even when David kept reading, it mentioned pagans. Well, guess what? The Muslims were also at war with the pagans during that time. So again, the context matches what I'm saying. And then David brings up the point of abrogation. The verses that talk about uh, making peace have all been abrogated and so forth. You don't have to believe me, um, just look at the ground facts. If uh, that was the case, then why did the Islamic State have a vibrant non-Muslim population living under it? And that's not what Muslims say. Non-Muslim scholars even talk about the great tolerance of the Islamic State. Christians themselves, during the time, wrote about how tolerant they were. Jews themselves had their golden age under Muslims. I mean, when the Muslims went to Jerusalem, just to illustrate this, the site of uh, Solomon's Temple Mount, the place was a garbage dump. The Muslims fixed the site up. That was the Muslims who restored the site of Solomon. And then the Jews were again allowed to worship in their holy city. And these are all historical facts. So obviously, I don't know what's been abrogated. You know, these people aren't being fought. They're not being forced to Islam. And they were being protected. They were being given their rights. And so that's history. So you just look at the ground facts. And again, the oldest churches are in the Middle East, in Muslim countries. So if everything is as black and white as David is trying to make it out to be, then why are they there? They shouldn't even exist. They should have all been wiped out because they didn't become Muslims. But they were all there. They're all thriving in the Middle East and they were living uh, well off. And so I believe those were his, I mean, again, yeah, that's it. And I don't think there's any other point. So, yeah. The third rebuttal will be given by David. You have eight minutes. All right, Sammy uh, asks, you responded to my question about uh, whether a person today would be given uh, the kind of leeway that, uh, that an early Muslim convert would be given. Um, and he says maybe a little, but not the same kind of leeway the, the early Muslims uh, were given. But, I mean, think about that. Uh, are we following the example of Muhammad? If we're following the example of Muhammad, then you do give them the same leeway. If you're not, if you're saying, no, we have different rules for... Muslim converts today, then you're saying, well, we're not going to follow the pattern of Muhammad himself. Sammy said, well, maybe some people didn't know that Muhammad, maybe some people didn't know that Muhammad had uh, forbade the practice of Mutta and only found out later during the time of Umar. And you do find, you do find a hadith giving that position, but the point, the point I'm trying to make is the a hadith are inconsistent you have Muslims saying that it wasn't outlawed during the time of Muhammad. It wasn't outlawed. It was outlawed during the time of Umar. And the people who said it was outlawed during the time of Muhammad were followers of Umar who were trying to go back and, and say that this is what Muhammad taught. So you have the disagreement. And I don't, care, I don't really care if you want to say Muhammad did it versus Umar did it. You, you have sources that can back that up. But the point is, if you did want to say the practice still applies today, you could very easily say, well, these are hadith right here that say that Umar forbade it. Um, I'm going to go with those. I'm going to go with those sources. And uh, I don't believe rightly guided caliphs can overrule Muhammad's interpretations, so I get to practice it if I want it. So it's really up to you, because even in your Sahih narrations, your most reliable narrations, uh, you find inconsistencies. Um, Sammy again said, Muhammad didn't want to divorce Sauda. I, 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 I'm granting that for the sake of arg argument. I believe he did. I believe he did. But I'm granting almost everything he's saying for the sake of argument. Let's suppose Muhammad had no intention 
of ever divorcing Sauda. And let's suppose uh, she was totally, utterly mistaken, and Muhammad was just going to be faithful to her forever and take care of her for forever. This is the problem. Suppose all of that is true. Then when your wife somehow gets the wrong idea, she's mistaken, she comes to you and thinks you're going to leave her. If she was totally mistaken, why wouldn't you say that? Wouldn't a good role model say, again, you're mistaken? Why would you get that idea? Whatever, I, whatever I've done to give you the idea that I'm going to abandon you, I, I, I'm sorry, I will never do that. I will take care of you forever. Why wouldn't he have said that? Why would it be, why would his response be, oh, you think I'm going to divorce you and you're willing to give me more time with Aisha and I don't have to take care of you in the same way? Okay, that's a good idea. And that's the response we find in the Quran. And the Quran puts its stamp of approval on that. Says, yes, Sauda was right for making that arrangement with Muhammad. Again, we're asking ourselves, is this uh, a good role model? Sammy says, Aisha was mentally ready for marriage, and how do we know? Because she became a scholar, and we do find in, in, uh, in, in the, the sources, we find tons of narrations from Aisha. He said she led an army into battle. This was called, uh, uh, this was, it's called the Battle of the Camel, because they rallied around uh, Aisha's, Aisha's camel, and, and she led out an, an army uh, against Ali. Uh, so those are true, and he says uh, Aisha was, you know, this very strong girl. And I'll grant, I'll grant, I'll grant here. When I when I read the hadith, the major hadith collections, Aisha is my favorite, uh, my favorite figure in there, uh, mainly because she's she's always talking trash to everybody, and you know, I, I find that I don't know, I like I like people who do that. Um, but uh, Aisha is a, a great character, but I don't see how you get the idea that because decades down the road she led a battle, and because. She had many stories that she uh, passed on from Muhammad that therefore, when she was nine years old, she was ready for marriage. I don't see how there's the connection. Certainly later on, Aisha was, uh, was an influential figure, uh, but I don't understand uh, the connection. Now, Sammy says that 65 verse 4 refers to prearranged marriage. That's not what it refers to. It, refer it refers to divorce rules. It refers to divorce proceedings. How are you going to divorce uh, a, whip, a woman, because the objection arose um, earlier in the Quran, earlier, an earlier revelation had said, if you're going to divorce a woman, you wait a few months, you wait until she's had, she's gone through her cycle, and then you can divorce her if you know she's not pregnant. Well, the objection came, what about various kinds of women who don't have menstruation, either because they're too old or because they're too young? They haven't reached the age of puberty. And Surah 65 verse 4 is meant as a response to that. And it says, if a girl is too young, she hasn't reached the age of menses, and you're divorcing her, then you wait three months so that you can make sure she's not pregnant. Well, how is Sammy saying that this refers to a woman you haven't had sex with? According to the Quran, there is no waiting period if you haven't had sex with her. You can, if you marry someone and you change your mind very quickly, uh, and you haven't had sex with her, there is no waiting period. So if the Quran lays down a waiting period for divorcing this girl who, 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 who has not reached the age of puberty, what does that mean? It means you've had sex with her, and it means the Quran allows sex with prepubescent girls. And read the commentaries. If you want, if you disagree with me, when you come down for the Q&A, say, David, give me the commentaries of Ibn Kathir and Ibn Abbas and uh, Jalla Lane, give me the commentaries. I'll, I'll, I promise you, I will bring them up for you. Uh, Sammy says, I want to throw out Islamic methodology when I interpret Surah 929. How am I throwing out Islamic methodology? I read you the entire passage in context. So certainly part of Islamic methodology that you would want to read things in the context of the Quran. You don't take one verse out and leave, or leave out the surrounding verses. But I also went to the historical context in Ibn Kathir. And according to Ibn Kathir, this issue arose not because the Muslims were being attacked, but because they were wondering how they were going to get money. And at the end of the passage, it specifically says, based on this revelation, Muhammad went out to fight at the Battle of Tabuk, the expedition to Tabuk. And the Romans, the Byzantines, didn't even show up. They didn't show up to the battle because they didn't want to fight. So based on 929, Muslims launched an offensive campaign against the Byzantines. This was not defensive. And Sammy said, well, even according to the passage, yes, the Byzantines wanted to extinguish the light of Islam. What did the passage actually say? 
They want to extinguish the light of Allah with their mouths. This is talking about people speaking falsely about God. So even according to the little clip Sammy quoted, this is not talking about fighting aggressors, it's talking about fighting people who have false beliefs, who say false things, who have different practices from the ones Muslims have. And Sammy says, well, the Jews and Christians had a, a great time under Islam. Well, look, if Jews and Christians ever had a great time, I'm not saying, uh, you know, there, there have been periods of, uh, of peace where Muslims and Christians and Jews have lived in harmony. When we have those periods in history, it's not because of Islam. It's not because of what Muhammad taught. What did Muhammad taught? They pay the jizya, you fight them until they're, they feel themselves subdued, until they feel subjugated. And if you read the Muslim commentaries on how people are to uh, pay the jizya, uh, the dhimmis, the Christians and Jews who are subjugated to Islam, have to come crawling on their knees. The Muslim will grab them by their beards and strike them on the jaw in order to show them their inferior position. This is not me talking. This is not me talking. This is what your sources say. So, again, we have to ask ourselves, is this a good moral example? Uh, certainly more we can discuss, but I would say no. There will be three minutes for each speaker for conclusion. So, Sammy, you have three minutes. All right, uh, thank you. Now, in tonight's this afternoon's debate, all of my uh, presentation points I made remain. All those points stand as they are. Those examples show that he was a good role model. Now, obviously, we had a lot of criticism of the Prophet Muhammad, but in reality, there was no criticism because David is saying one thing, but the text is saying something completely different. Like Sauda. David is saying the Prophet wanted to divorce Sauda. Uh, she was scared and all of this, yet the Prophet never wanted to divorce her. Secondly, the Sauda never went to the Prophet and said, I'm so scared you're going to divorce me, and the Prophet then told her, you know what, that's a good deal. That never happened. And thirdly, if somebody wants to get a divorce, they'll get a divorce. End of story. If I want to divorce a lady, I want to get rid of her. It doesn't matter if she comes and tells me, you know what, we'll spend more, uh, less time. No, it doesn't work like that. The Prophet told her she's mistaken by an action by never divorcing her. That's how he told her, you're wrong. I don't want to divorce you because we're not getting divorced. Simple. And the issue of mut'a. Again, he admits that that was banned during the lifetime of the Prophet, but he says it's inconsistent. No, it's not inconsistent. It's very logical to know why it still happened. These were people that did not communicate with modern communication systems. And Islam was still growing to vast lands and territory. So some people might still have heard that message and didn't know it was uh, abrogated. And Omar just cleared it up. Very simple. That's not inconsistent at all. What about Aisha? Uh, how do we know she's not mentally scarred? Because she came to all of those things. If she was an oppressed victim, as many people like to say, she would never become a great Islamic scholar, become a great Islamic leader. That's the proof. Thank you. And as for the wars, Muslims are supposed to conquer and do all of this. He's saying one thing. Look at the facts. Christian communities are still in the Middle East. They were there during the lifetime of the Prophet. It, they didn't just have a good life, life after the Prophet. They had a good life under the Prophet, under the Caliphs, they were given their religious freedom, tolerance under the Prophet and the Caliphs, early Islam. So you don't have to uh, look at what we're saying, just look at the facts. That's historical facts to show that it's not that black and white. And uh, the last point about the jizya, you have to uh, grab the people by their beards and that is false. Maybe some Islamic source says that, but uh, Islamic scholarship is unanimous that when you collect the jizya, uh, you don't uh, pull the guys and they don't come crawling to you and uh, bowing to you and all of that. Maybe someone said it, but anyone can say anything in an Islamic source. The unanimous consensus is that they don't do that. And the only people who do pay the jizya are adult males. Females, children, religious persons, handicapped persons and so forth are not required to pay the jizya and the jizya is simply a tax that renders a service 
we pay taxes for our police force and so forth. And the Muslims, as I said, have their taxes that they pay to the state, such as the zakat. So my time is up. Thank you. David, you have three minutes for your conclusion. Three minutes and 30 seconds. Well, I'd like to, to thank everyone, to thank Sammy. Um, you know, I know I'm a Christian. When you know someone's uh, criticizing Christianity, it's not always fun. And I know I'm criticizing uh, Muhammad, raising all kinds of objections. I know that's not uh, necessarily fun. So I uh, thank everyone for being patient, for listening uh, to both sides. And um, as I said in my, uh, you know, I, in the beginning, I, I don't think Muhammad was you know the worst person in history. But this is a debate, so I'm focusing on the things. Uh, related to the topic and uh, I just I think given given what we find many of you I know many of you uh, by the looks on your faces were disturbed by lots of the things that we find in the Muslim sources and if you are you have to think about why that is if you really believe in Muhammad you have to wonder uh, why these things are there whether you agree with them or not if you at the end of the day if you say I really believe in Muhammad and I believe Surah 3321 that Muhammad is the pattern you have to accept some very interesting things or you can go against the obvious meaning of the passages so if you really believe in Muhammad you have a choice you can look at Surah 929 fight those who do not believe and you can either say I'm going to fight those who do not believe or you can say I'm going to assume that doesn't mean what it says I'm going to assume that when the next verse says that it's because these they, these people are Christians and Jews, they're uh, extinguishing the light of Allah later in the passage, um, that it, it can't mean that. But where are you getting that meaning? You're not getting that meaning from the text. The text is perfectly clear. In, in, in this case, I agree, the text is perfectly clear, as the Quran often says of itself. Uh, so if you want to disagree with these passages. If you don't want to apply this pattern to society, what are you saying? Muhammad said, fight those who do not believe, but I'm not going to do it. I'm going to reinterpret it. Muhammad said, uh, kill apostates. If anyone leaves Islam, kill him, but I'm not going to interpret it that way. I'm going to reinterpret it. Muhammad said, you can uh, beat your wives into submission if they keep getting out of line. And we have the example of a woman being beaten until her skin turned green, but I'm not going to interpret it that way. But think about this. If you go with your own interpretation every time and you just make these passages mean whatever you want them to mean. Are you really adopting the pattern of Muhammad or are you uh, making Muhammad conform to your pattern and the pattern that you believe in? On the other hand, we have the, the family issues of Muhammad uh, marrying uh, 9 to 11 wives, uh, Muhammad's relationship with Aisha, Muhammad's relationship with Sauda, Muhammad and his other wives, and do you believe these things are okay? Do you believe that Mutta, at least even if you go with Sammy's interpretation and say Muhammad outlawed it, uh, do you believe that these things are okay? Do you believe that when if people are used to having sex, you don't tell them, well, now's the time to stop, you're a Muslim, that you give them leeway, as Sammy said Muhammad did for at least a time. Uh, these are the questions you have to consider. And when I look at these things, again, I see things in Muhammad's life that are good, and certain things would be good to follow. But I look at these other things and I think, uh, these teachings, if they were practiced today, would be disastrous for society. And so I can say that Muhammad is not a good role model for society.